This week, an earthquake in China, a stabbing in a Texas school. The economy continues in turmoil, and unemployment still an issue for many. We are a society under a great deal of stress. Tonight, how is all of this pressure affecting us as a community? How can we cope? And what can be done to bring our lives back into balance? I'm Ernie Manous, and this is Houston 8. We see it everywhere, school students acting out in a harassing manner, children's suicide rates on the rise, recession and work anxieties building up to cause depression and uncertainty in both our home and work lives, local, national and international unrest creating fear and pressure within each of us, and the worry of natural disaster from flood, hurricanes and earthquakes seems more justified now than ever before. Each one of us has encountered various stressors at different points during our lives, but rarely have so many events affected such a large population in such a relentless fashion. What happens when a whole community is under such stress and anxiety for such a prolonged period of time? How do we cope and relieve the pressure before it's too late? Joining us tonight are Dr. John Vincent, Professor of Clinical Psychology Training, University of Houston. Dr. Lee Miller, Assistant Professor of Sociology, Sam Houston State University. And Dr. Britta Ostermeyer, Chief of Psychiatry at Ben Taub General Hospital. Welcome to all of you. you. We start off the show by saying that rarely are so many people under so much pressure for such a prolonged period of time. Dr. Ostermeyer, do you think that that is an accurate statement to start with? Probably so. We have had a lot of things come together lately, and it means that this is a time that we have to be vigilant and we have to be ready to recognize the warning signs of problems and look around and recognize in schools and at home what can be done. So if there is a problem, that we are ready to seek help. Dr. Miller, do you see it as a community's problem or is it an individual problem? Well, I think they're so interrelated that we can't separate one from another. Um, Individuals certainly might exhibit symptoms, um, but I think that those symptoms can be either attenuated or accentuated depending on the social context and their, their networks to help them cope with those symptoms. Does a community react like an individual? Can you look at it and see an, a group of people reacting in a prescribed manner to something like this? Or Well, I think you can talk about in terms of a, a sort of a social syndrome. And uh, in the field of disaster research, certainly we talk about things like collective trauma and corrosive communities. Um, it, ways in which communities as a whole are damaged by uh, a disaster of some kind. So a a syndrome having a collection of symptoms that affect more or less a wide range of individuals in the same manner or in very similar manners is something that we use to describe individual symptoms, but we can also use that to describe a community. Dr. Vincent, let's understand the difference here between stress, anxiety, and depression. Well, they are actually rather interrelated. Uh, Stress and anxiety are probably the two things that are most similar, Uh, and it's the body's natural response and the psyche's natural response to some kind of a threat or some kind of a trauma. And it has a survival value in the sense that it keeps us uh, sort of poised to act if we need to. The problem is, under periods of chronic stress, um, our bodies and our psyches are sort of poised to be hypervigilant. We're always looking around, wondering where the danger is, and that's what really produces some of the discomfort. Depression is obviously a mood disorder uh, that are often triggered by anxiety. Very often, people who've been subjected to prolonged stress or prolonged anxiety then develop symptoms of depression, which basically means they lose interest in their lives, they become really sad, they have trouble sleeping, they have trouble eating, uh, they are at risk for suicide, 
And so uh, those things together, I think, really uh, are very much related to each other. When we talk about stress and anxiety, and you say, and then that can lead to depression, right. what else can stress and anxiety lead to in people? Well, a number of things. Uh, uh, we see various maladaptive ways that people cope. We see that there are increases in substance abuse uh, in response to stress. People self-medicating, trying to manage as best they can. Often people will turn inward. They'll cut off relationships with other people at a time that they probably need them the most. Are those not also those symptoms of depression? Absolutely. But How they, do you split them? Well, it, I don't think it's all that necessary that you split out what's depression and what's anxiety because they tend to, to co-occur um, okay. and they are both manifestations of I think the same phenomena. With anxiety in particular one of the things that many people do to cope is they avoid. They stay away from whatever it is that they're afraid of which although it's a natural human instinct often tends to make matters worse. Okay, for all of you, take, let me get your opinions on this. I tend to always end up beating up on the 24-hour news cycle. But I can't help but think, okay, there is an earthquake in China. 20 years ago, we would hear about it, and then the next night we might see something on the news, read something in the paper the next day. Today, it happens, we see footage. We're there, we're in it, day in, day out. Does this have an effect on us as, a, as the human species? It does have an impact on on all of us and it has more so an impact on those who already struggle with anxiety who are already stressed out have limited resources or who are already at risk for depression or who are already depressed mm -hmm. any any other thoughts on it sure uh, I, I think what happens is that that when we see something like that, it's very difficult not to empathize, to ask the question, I wonder what that would be like for me, to almost mm -hmm. uh, uh, live it ourselves a bit. And I think having our living rooms inundated with images, mm -hmm. uh, often horrific images, of mm -hmm. what is happening to those people can have a really profound effect on us. So what do we do? I mean, our technology seems to be taking us one direction, and our, now our want to know more but then it must have a negative impact on us to have all of this, all the time, never a reprieve. We have to limit at times what we expose ourselves to. For instance, when 9-11 took place, we actually did research in New York at uh, Columbia University, and we actually studied those who were exposed imminently in New York City, than those in the neighborhoods, but also those who watched on television. And the research did show that mm -hmm. those who experienced the trauma watching on television were also impacted. So it is okay at times to not watch all the time television and also be careful how much the children at home watch and to have time out. So to watch ongoing and over and over might not be a good conducive thing to do at home. Uh, Dr. Miller, let me ask this. When we talk about 9-11 yes. and we know about all of the anxieties and the stresses mm -hmm. and all of that 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 put on us, but that's an event. When you look at something like what's going on today where it's natural disasters, the economy, children problems, personal problems, whether or not mm -hmm. you're going to have a job or not tomorrow, all that, do we see that prolonged period of that level of stress mm. is similar to a catastrophic event. Do they have any kind of similarities there? Well, I think it's important to make the distinction between uh, the kind of disaster. Um, when we think of natural disasters, we think of something that is uh, confined in a certain time space. It has a definite beginning and it has an end. The wind stops blowing, it stops raining, or the, wa the flood waters recede. Uh, then there are technological disasters, and technological disasters are fundamentally different, and their impact on communities are fundamentally different. And so technological disasters like 9-11 or like any kind of environmental disaster that occur because mm -hmm. of human error, human hands were involved, um, those, the impact of those tends to be much more prolonged. Right. And the 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 temporal mm -hmm. aspect is not so clear to, clearly defined mm -hmm. right. and so it blurs the distinction between an acute event and a chronic condition and i right. think what we're seeing is that much like the technological disasters that 
this is a this is sort of a chronic condition mm-hmm. of stress that and anxiety and all of the symptoms that were mentioned linked to anxiety and depression so that the the aftermath of a technological disaster is very much like what we see w- with with what's going on now what also matters is how the aftermath is dealt with Absolutely. for instance if something went wrong mm-hmm. if the party who wronged another party then goes ahead and apologizes and tries to make the party whole again, Mm -hmm. then the impact of the trauma is much less. So it it really matters also how the aftermath is dealt with. This is very important and makes an impact of how big the trauma will be. Mm-hmm. But our, our viewers, they're sitting at home, and they're, they're concerned about their kids at school. We're hearing about their stabbings and suicides and all of that, and mm-hmm. there's the cyberbullying that's mm-hmm. all going on, right. and, and kids are reacting. So your parents, first of all, have that fear. Mm-hmm. Then it's you don't know. Are you going to be laid off? Are you going to be furloughed? Is your job going to be here tomorrow? You've mm-hmm. got that pressure. Then you turn on the news, and you see that in Haiti and China, and there are these earthquakes happening. When's it going to hit mm-hmm. us? Where are the fault lines in America? They're checking it all out. Then we have hurricane season coming, and it just seems like there's got to be some reprieve in all this. Right. What is helpful to do is not to catastrophize, that we have to look at our problems at home, but we also have to then prioritize. We have to say, okay, these are the problems we have to work on, and these are the problems we have to put on the back burner. Because if we look at all of the problems, our personal problems, the world problems, the neighborhood problems, it becomes so overwhelming that we can't deal with it. So Mm -hmm. it's very important that all of us pick the problems that are pertinent for us to work on. And there might be only like three or four problems. But I'm betting there are people out there that are saying, all of these bother me. All of these are sure. affecting me. And if I don't have a job, if my kid gets beaten up, if, if right. there's if there's sure. a hurricane that whips through here and we got hurt last time during this storm and that storm, where do you draw the lines? If they can't draw the lines themselves, then it might be time to come in for some help and counseling exactly. and receive mm-hmm. the help. We right. have a... Um, We have Harris County Hospital District here. Mm -hmm. We have 17 locations where we can see patients and uh, provide counseling sessions and explore what the problems at home are, what the person is stressed out about, and then help them to prioritize. And sometimes Mm -hmm. a few counseling sessions, sessions, as many as maybe one, two, or three, can make a difference. Dr. Vincent? Absolutely. Well, I I think it's important to remember that... that, uh, um, in response to a, a uh, catastrophic disaster where there is a time limit, the more chronic kinds of things do sort of chip away at somebody's mm-hmm. ability to cope. And I heartily agree with, uh, uh, with Dr. Ostermeyer that, that uh, some kind of assistance to help people mobilize their adaptive coping resources is a really, really good idea. There are people in the audience, though, that are going to say, I understand if I'm in a funk why I need to go and get help. And I don't mean to belittle it by calling it a funk, but I think you know what I mean. But the economy is a real situation that I have no direct effect on ultimately. If, if my company shuts down, I'm unemployed. I really can't. Going to see somebody to help me think about it and deal with the process isn't going to change reality. Well, that's actually uh, not entirely true uh, because part of what we look at when we deal with anybody's response to a stressor is so-called problem-focused coping, Mm -hmm. which is how you define things that you actually do have some control over. And then managing the emotions. Those generally have have to do with the kinds of problems that don't lend themselves to something I can do. If I lose my job, what I can do is go look for another job, but the fact that it's having tremendous effect on myself and my family is going to generate emotions that are going to be a challenge to deal with. But I think part of what good uh, counseling or therapy does is help people figure out what they can do, what pieces of this they have control over, what pieces of this they really don't have control over, and how to cope with both of those. Uh, generally, when people are under a tremendous, a tremendous amount of stress, they often forget or quit doing things that for them can be very adaptive. And Mm -hmm. so part of our job is to help mobilize those things to get people through. I want to go over to community for a second a little bit more and talk Dr. Miller on this, that 
as a community, as these mm -hmm. things build, as these problems continue, as this information is out there, do we see us as a society reacting differently? And if so, what are the things we're looking at going on right now? And uh, the reason I pose that is I think, are people shorter tempered? Are they ruder to each other? Are there, are there certain symptoms we see when this stuff continues? Well, again, drawing from the disaster literature, uh, I think, yes, there are definitely symptoms that we can uh, begin to, to see. Are we noticing uh, any here now? Well, um, I I would assume so. I haven't studied that, um, but uh, things to watch for would be the shortness of temper. Uh, as you mentioned, the um, increase in alcohol and uh, drug use and abuse. <clears throat> uh, domestic violence uh, tends to escalate in times of uh, mm -hmm. very severe uncertainty, so that the problems may not be well defined yet in individuals' lives, mm -hmm. but the feeling, the sort of general malaise, um, of extreme uncertainty. I have a job now, but will I have it next week? Mm -hmm. Or I'm worried about my kids in school. They haven't been bu bullied yet, but I'm worried mm -hmm. about those issues. I'm worried about the people in Haiti. I'm worried. Mm -hmm. um, and so that uncertainty, is it going to happen to me? How is it going to affect me? I could be that person. Right. And that is, worrying, though, builds right. a lack of sleep, poor mm -hmm. appetite or poor health choices in what exactly. you eat. Right. The, yes. As we said, substance abuse, the right. drinking, all that can be because mm -hmm. of this, correct? Yes, yes. and it can lead to isolation, social isolation. Mm -hmm. And as mm -hmm. a sociologist, of course, uh, I'm, I'm more concerned with the, the, what, how it affects how people interact with one another. And so if you get people isolating themselves uh, as family members or as neighbors or as members of a congregation, you notice that there are certain people who mm -hmm. tend to be pulling away or acting a little bit differently than they usually do, then, then it, it might be time to lend a, reach out a hand. It almost and, sounds perfect stormish because as the, the society is moving that way mm -hmm. due to stress and all that. Technology has been moving us more towards isolation. With all that. So we've got Absolutely. both hitting at once, right. which I'm assuming is not a healthy place for us to be. That's correct. Especially at this yeah. point with all the, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I can see in a perfect time some people choose to step back mm, a little, yes. but when you've got all of it at once, the right. ramifications is going to be much worse. One of the most important buffers against stress and anxiety is connectedness with other people. And I think the irony is that when, in response to stress and anxiety, people isolate themselves, they are depriving themselves of one of the things that's most important. Ideally, we reach out to family, friends, neighbors, people we go to church with, people we interact with. And there's a, I think, a very powerful positive effect that those kinds of relationships have. And when we become more isolated, focusing on just ourselves, uh, we're uh, basically cut off from that source of help. Mm -hmm. Again, counseling sessions can be very helpful. If somebody worries about everything, that person can be helped to figure out what do I have to worry about and focus on what is it that I shouldn't be worried about because if I worry about those items, then I cannot spend my energy focusing on what I need to fix, what I can fix, what is really within my control because if I worry about everything, I lose the sleep, I am fatigued, and then I might not go to work, and then eventually I do become depressed, and I am not functional anymore, and worse things can happen. Just as behavior can affect in the direction you're talking about, if you find yourself in a, once again, I'm going to use my term, in a funk, mm -hmm. uh, you start to head toward depression. Mm -hmm. If you start behaving in a manner that you would outside of depression, mm -hmm. will that start to affect the way you right. think and the way you process it and lift you out of it? Very good point. In fact, uh, in the treatments for depression these days, we do something called behavioral activation, which is a kind of silly way of describing what we just want people to do, which is to re-engage, start doing things. Uh, it's sort of fake it till you make it. It's uh, act in ways that uh, are consistent with what you would feel like or do if you weren't depressed. And that really does have a powerful effect on mood, on a sense of well-being. It recreates this feeling of I actually do have some control over my own destiny. 
and positive things happen from that. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting at home and you have found yourself detached from the right. community, you don't feel like going out, you don't right. feel like making dinner, you don't get up and do those things right. even if you don't feel like it, and in time you right. will start to to feel okay doing them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even if you just can do some baby steps, maybe one outing, maybe go back to church on one outing a week, or but start doing start something. Start re-engaging. Because mm -hmm. if you sit at home, the shutters closed, in bed, you're definitely feeding the depression. Yeah. Right. We mm -hmm. talked a little bit about cyberbullying, right. and uh, I, I think that plays into all of this in some degree. It's almost like mm -hmm. the children are experiencing also their own set of these mm -hmm. problems. As a parent, if you're noticing these things in your child, if you notice them being more withdrawn or depressed or not as uh, full of joy to do the things mm -hmm. they used to do. What can you do, especially if you have a teenager, mm -hmm. so that you don't isolate them more mm -hmm. or make them say, hey, stay back, this is my life kind of right. thing? Any thoughts? Yeah, I think the two things with kids that help in matters like this uh, is communication and involvement. And parents who are involved in their kids' lives, I think, are much more sensitive to some of the signs that this isn't characteristic for my child. Something's going on here. You get those little warning signs that go off uh, that uh, alert you to the possibility that, that something is going on. Now, the communication part of it is also, in, uh, is also critical. Now, most kids, if you said, let's sit down and have a talk, what you're going to get is a you know, massive shutdown. Uh, right. Kids don't generally do that. So uh, when I work with parents, what I will do is, is suggest that they look for these little snippets, little openings, little opportunities where the child may indicate something that they're thinking about or interested in that you follow up on. And that kind of communication, I think, is a really great way of helping kids know that there is somebody there who cares about them, who's interested in their well-being, and who they will go to if they're having some struggles that they just can't manage. I'd like to connect that to sort of what we can do on the community level. Mm -hmm. And things that seem to help are, uh, again, some sort of a task or an event that can bring people together uh, across any lines of division or day-to-day -day sort of in standard interaction, parent-child uh, rut of communication or lack thereof. Something that focuses the attention away and gives uh, perhaps a new dynamic so that you're involving people and you're, you're getting them all focused in one way in a sense of sort of connectedness or togetherness. And another thing is uh, allowing opportunities for agency so that people, uh, including teenagers mm -hmm. uh, and children, have some feeling that they can do something, they can accomplish a task, or they can, so that even if it's something small, mm -hmm. a craft project mm -hmm. or mowing the lawn or, or a gardening mm -hmm. or something, but that they, in a small way at least, can make a difference. And those two things on the community level seem to mm -hmm. uh, help communities heal after disasters. Mm -hmm. I have noticed that uh, among my friends, among coworkers, I always hear people referring to next week things will be slower, or if I can just get through this week. <laughs> and what I think we're all noticing is yes. there is no next week. It's always, is this a new lifestyle with the technology and our mm -hmm. connection to the whole world all at once and everything there, that this is just something we need to get used to, that we need to set a new set of parameters and priorities, that we can't rely on what we used to do, or is that, will things slow down? I think it's up to us we have to also tell ourselves we are busy and life moves on really fast and maybe faster today, apparently faster today. We have to tell ourselves for our own good and our family life, no, I can't wait until next week. I'm really going to have to make time this evening to have an outing with my family because I've learned that if I don't do it tonight, next week it's the same. I'm going to mm -hmm. be busy mm -hmm. again. So it's really important to do that. We have to have this opportunity now, this week, to set dedicated family time or personal time aside. And that's really important for mm -hmm. us and our family. I completely agree. Um, 
I, I think we all need to have things to look forward to, and I think it may be an illusion to think that it's going to get better, but it's, yeah. a, but it's a useful illusion because the uh, implication is that things will get better, and I think that indeed they do get better. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I also believe that you have to sort of buy the concept that uh, you need to clock out every once in a while. You need to get, you know, basically mm -hmm. say, Absolutely. I am done working. I've done as much as I'm going to do. I'm going to regroup and spend some time relaxing, enjoying my family, enjoying the things that I do. And if you don't explicitly build that in, there isn't going to be a little crumb of time at the end of the day that will just <laughs> magically emerge. Uh, you have to be able to create that to have Dr. it Dr. Miller, work. I'm going to give you five seconds. Wrap us up. Well, I think that, uh, as um, Dr. Vincent was saying, that Yes, we, it will get better, but I think that technology has uh, outpaced our coping mechanisms. It's moving so fast that we haven't had time to develop how best to cope. So we need to learn how to do that on our everyday lives as we'll, we'll as vacation. We'll have to learn on another vacation. show because we right. are, out, as always, out of time. <laughs> out of time. We'll have to come back with that. Thank you all for being here. Now, each week we invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Simply click on the local programs bar, pick Houston 8, and you can join our online community. Read about the guests, learn more about the topic, share your thoughts and ideas, and even suggest questions we might ask during upcoming episodes. Remember, information posted on our website may be used on air, so keep that in mind when submitting. That does it for us tonight. Until next time, I'm Ernie Manus. Good night.